Well, hello and welcome to that beautiful hour of the day. You're probably sat back now and uh, waiting to hear what the conversation is going to be on PM Express today. Well, the conversation is one that has been shelved for a while. That should not be shelved. And as you know, with everything, we leave it to the last minute when it's completely out of hand and then we come out all guns blazing, try to solve it. I've also said here one day that, look, after we've all ganged up and made Galamse an agenda to try and fight it, which is good, what next other social menace should we pick and then fight? Should it be sanitation? Should it be health? Should it be education? But guess what? Population growth. Mm -hmm. Population growth is one menace which will come home and bite us right in the face if we are not careful. Not just population growth, but the speed with which the population is growing and the quality with which we are producing. If we don't sit back and put a check to it, because these things have to be done deliberately. If we don't deliberately go and make sure this is checked, folks, how many hospitals can we build? How many classroom blocks can we build? How many doctors can we train? How will social amenity equity ever be achieved so that we can also say we are a developed country? That's one agenda that I hope can be put on the front burner. My name is Nanan Sakwal, the fourth chief of Akwamua Dumasa and your favorite talk show host. When I come back, we are going to discuss the menace population explosion. You will be amazed. Don't move. Well, thank you very much for staying. And as I said, we're looking at Ghana's population growth, something which I think should be our next agenda. Because if you're able to regulate it, all other things may fall into place or become easier to manage. With me in studio is Dr. Leticia Apia, Executive Director, National Population Council. Doctor, you're welcome. Thank you, Nana. And there's a fine for first time, uh, first time is, you know, I'm Banta Monsa. Oh. Uh, so my, my viewers and, and I are going to find doctor, but maybe because they're doctor, we, we wave it. There are some that we wave, so we may wave yours. Thank you. <laughs> Doc, uh, first of all, what, what's the National Population Council and what, what do you do? Yeah, thank you so much, Nana. The National Population Council is actually a statutory body set up by government to advise government on population and related issues okay. because uh, the government of Ghana recognizes that population is by, I mean population development and the population growth should be in sync so there should be an optimal growth for development to improve the quality of life of Ghanaians. How long has it been? Uh... Oh, the National Population Council, the first population policy we had was actually in 1969 and it was the third, the, Ghana is the third country to have had a population policy after Mauritius and Kenya. And uh, it was revised in 92 and given assent in 1994. So since 1994 to date, or even since 69, we've had a population policy with targets set in there. Now, so uh, in the first policy was 69? 69. 69, yes. So what, what was the agenda set or what was the policy target then? Well, the first policy identified uncontrolled population growth as a problem. And there's a statement... Far back at 69. Yes, there's a statement that was made in that policy that currently, that is then, in 69, they didn't have a problem. But then if we don't do something about the population growth, in the year 2000, we're going to have problems with population growth. The, the effects of population growth will catch up with us. So in that policy, the target was set at a, a growth rate of 1.7 by the year 2000. In 69, the growth rate was 3, 3%. And they set a target of 1.7 by the year 2000. But unfortunately, we didn't meet it because currently we are still 2.5. Okay, now, now viewers, we've seen the slide on, on, on your screen. Doc, should we go back or do we start from here? I think we go back, right? Well, we can... Let, let's go back. Uh, give us a slide before this. 
Well, this, this is just comparing the two countries because we always compare ourselves to Malaysia. Malaysia. Mm -hmm. We had the same uh, independence in, 19, in 1957 from the colonial mm -hmm. masters. So we just, I just decided to compare okay. Malaysia. Because so let's go to the next slide. A lot of comparison. And uh, the, the previous one, please. So this is the uh, Ghana's population uh, trend. Mm -hmm. You see, we were 2.3 in two, 1921. Wow. And 24.6 million in 2010. So and this 25 the million that we are saying today, that's, that's well off the mark then. You normally say oh, we Which are 25 one? million. We are no, we are more than 25 million. This is 2010, okay. and this is a census. So okay. we are can, currently about 29 million. Okay. Yeah. And at the growth rate of 2.5, we will double every 28 years. Every 28 years, we will double. But then if we had a growth rate of 1.5, then we would double every 47 years. So then you would have time to develop. But this, we have to keep catching up with health, education, you know, the basics of life. Mm -hmm. So that is why it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Growth is good, but the rate is where the challenge is. Globally, the growth rate is 1.5. That's a global growth rate. And what are we doing? 2.5. And we are 2.5. Wow. Yeah. Next so slide. the next slide. Well, because we keep comparing ourselves to Malaysia, and you see Malaysia has actually, they want to achieve a, growth, a population growth of 70 million by the year 2100. So they have actually been projected the number of people they think they would need for optimal development. But we don't have... I see. Yeah, the next slide. You know, the total fertility rate is the number of children women should, would have between the ages of 15 and 49 years. Mm -hmm. So if they divide all the children in Ghana amongst all the women, everybody would have 4.2 children in Ghana compared to Malaysia where everybody would have 2.1. You see, we all started at six. The total fertility rate at six, Malaysia and Ghana. But then, Malaysia gradually is coming down with interventions, and Ghana stays up from six to two, four point two. So, which means we are not doing so well. Two point one is a replacement level. Two point one is growth. Okay. So that is a replacement level, but four point two is a bit too high. Our target is at least three by the year 2020. But we've been hovering around four for the past, since 1988 or so. And, and, and where is the expansion coming from? The expansion of? As in the, the growth. The growth? Yeah. Oh, OK. The growth is coming from our success. Mm -hmm. Our success in medicine, mm -hmm. because now we have a lot of, we don't have the killer diseases anymore. Mm -hmm. We don't have uh, smallpox, and you, you barely see children with chickenpox, you know. Mm -hmm. So we are decreasing mortality. Mortality is coming down. At least we are having better nutrition, uh, better water services, better sanitation, I mean, compared to uh, the past years. So mortality is coming down, life expectancy is coming up. But then fertility seems to be slowly coming down, but very slowly, not in sync with mortality. That is why the growth is coming. And then the, the, the other issue uh, the when we spoke is that, you know, those, the have-nots, if I'm allowed to say that, are those who will produce, you know, more. And those in the tricycles and the airports are rather, you know, minimizing how much they give them. Yeah, I think, I think probably we have failed them somehow. Because, you see, when you marry, having children is a default. Mm -hmm. But those who have actually intervene, you know, they, they, they intervene and to regulate the number of children that they would have, you know. But those in the rural areas are most of the time unempowered. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, we don't have all the complement of uh, methods, for instance, I mean, uh, to prevent pregnancies. Because if you look at our service uh, uh, data, our demographic and health survey report 2014, about 17% of the children were unwanted, you know, which means that if the women had the means, they would have prevented the children, I mean, uh, they would have prevented those pregnancies. 17% is high. 17% is pretty high, you know, which means that if we're actually even taking care of those 17%, we'll be getting close to our target of three. Mm. If we take 17% of 4.2, it means at least the, the uh, total fertility rate would have been 3.6, which is closer, which is close to the three that we want to get to as our target. So I think probably we need to uh, focus more 
on small family size. You know, I think we should, we should be looking at uh, quality and seeing how best to support our rural folks to make sure that the children that we bring up are quality. Because we, want to, we all want to go outside. We all want to go abroad. And they have fewer children. That's why they can develop. Age structure is one of the things that came up in your, uh, yeah. your you know, an, an analysis. Yeah. What, what's, is there a problem with the age structure? Yes. If you look at the age structure, this is uh, 0 to 14. You know, 0 to 14 and then 65 years and above are the dependent population. Okay. 0 to 14, we need shelter, we need food, we need clothing, we need education, at least for a minimum 15 years. So they will just be consuming. They will not be producing. Mm -hmm. So that group is very, very important because the producing group will be supporting this group. So if that bulge is very big, then it makes supporting difficult. Mm -hmm. The families cannot even save for the banks to, to, to lend out the monies for industries. Mm -hmm. Because if I haven't fed my children, how then do I get some money to save? You know? So that is the dependent group. That's what we call the dependent group. So if you look at what we have, 0 to 14, taking that alone, uh, by the 20, 2010 census, the proportion was 38.3%. You know, which is big, yeah. which is big compared to uh, our, our, our other counterparts, Malaysia, where the, 20, the 2010 data they had, the under 15 was just about 27%, wow. which means that they have fewer dependent, mm -hmm. yes, they have fewer dependent, uh, I mean, population okay. to take care of. And, so the dependency ratio... 65 plus yeah. to term dependent? Yes, it's also term dependent. Even though a lot of them, 65 plus theoretically is term dependent, but some of them are very rich. Yeah. Yes, some mm -hmm. of them are very, very rich. So if you're looking at the, the main thing is the child dependency ratio, the 0 to 15. But look, most if, of if, them are not rich. No, if, if you... I mean, on, on paper, you say 0 to 15. Yes. But, I mean, I, I don't know any... You know, 16 year old who says, Well, I mean, there may be one who's hustling, selling PK or something to survive, but generally, I mean, until you're 25, you know, you're, you're dependent somewhat. Yes, that's true. That's why the stress is really, really felt. That is why it's very, very difficult to develop, you know, because we have to, they, they are still dependent on us. You can, you have a 20 year old who theoretically is supposed to be in the uh, producing, in the bracket. producing in bracket. But then, in, uh, in, in, the in practice, is, is in the consumption group, you know. So it makes, it makes development, definitely development, very, very difficult. I mean, uh, why are issues like this not front burner issues? Because, I mean, they are staring at us in the face, and you can't get away from it. Yes, you really can't get away from it, because I, I equate the population structure to the foundation of any building. Mm. And for the foundation, unfortunately, you don't see it. You know, you never see any foundation. Somebody can say this building is nice because the structure up is nice, but not the foundation, you know. So you can get a building, the building cracks a little, then you cement it, cracks, you cement it, but then you should be looking at the foundation. So it can be lost on us if we really um, don't critically want to find it. It can be lost on us. I mean, you, you are, you know, the population guy. I mean, why, why is the state not bothered about. I mean, I haven't had any revolution or any adverts to say, look, slow down or, you know, that revolution. There's no revolution to, look, halt this process. Well, I think that's why we are here today. That's, we, started, <laughs> we have started the revolution, right? We started at the small the, family size. So uh, yes. the, 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 the Malaysia dependency ratio yes. compared to the Ghana dependency ra ratio, uh, how, 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 how does it break down? Because I've got... Uh, 1960, you know, yes. uh, 69 to 184. Yeah, if, uh, if you give it us on the screen, yeah, the Malaysia yeah, dependency no, ratio. Uh, the, okay, the one, the one before this, uh, yeah. that's the Malaysia age structure. Yes, that's the Malaysia age structure. So you mm -hmm. see, in 2010, the age structure is 27.4%, 0 to 14. But in 1957, they also had 43.8%. Wow. Yes. So we were apart. In, 19, 57. in 1957, yes, we were apart. Then they just, from 1980, they 
you actually gradually, trim it down? Yes, trim it down. Now, the, the, the dependency ratio, that's what I want you to explain Let, to, to me, the dependency ratio. Okay, then to be on the last slide. Oh, okay. But let, this, this, this is the Malaysia one? Yes. Oh. Yes. So how, how does it explain? You see, the dependency ratio, it's the 100 uh, people in the productive age. How many people are they taking care of? In the unproductive. In the unproductive age. So which means that in this case, 100 people in the productive age bracket are taking care of 48 people. Okay. De 48 dependents. You get it. Uh -huh. But then for Ghana in 2010, we had 100 people in the productive age taking care of 76 wow. dependents. Yes. You see, so then, even if the population, that is why population is not so much about the numbers, but the structure. Mm -hmm. Yes, because you can have the same number for, uh, for two countries, but then if one has a dependency ratio of 76 and the other has a dependency ratio of 50 or 40, obviously the one with the dependency ratio of 50 or 40 would do better because you have more people working to support fewer dependents. So apart from schools and the... Uh, 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 health you can have some theaters you can have parks you can develop other <laughs> nice things so that you don't just survive but then you thrive doc so the issue of quality then comes in here yes and uh, we we haven't focused a lot on, on 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 quality we are all free free this free that free this free this so from you know your expertise you know national population council you know what, what then do you advise how how do we stop free and move to quality, or, or how, do, how do we move? Well, there should be a balance between quality and quantity, because quantity, too, it, it's important. But I think we should, we should structure in such a way that we don't have more people being vulnerable, because if we're not, if we're not careful, then all of us will be vulnerable, and we only know who to support mm. who anymore, you know. So there should, be that, there should be that conscious effort to... For me, I think people should have the number of children they can comfortably take care of. You should have the number of children that you can comfortably take care of. You know, if you are going to buy a car, you don't go and buy a V8 if your, your money can buy a, a smaller car, mm -hmm. you know. So if you can take care of two children, fine. Iran has a policy. It also has a population policy. A population policy, it has a, a total fertility rate of three. So what Iran did to get to where they, they, they are is for three, free. Four, you pay for, or you get free family planning service. Okay. And then they also encourage the best spacing, because the best spacing, the too close, is not the best. And that is why our maternal mortality figures are up, you know. And for the maternal mortality figures, any one woman who dies, there are 30 others with maternal morbidities that we are not even talking about. Maternal morbidities are the fistulas, those who have had hypertension out of uh, uh, deliveries, those who are psychotic and all those things, you know, one mortality, 30 mobilities. And no, that is not know. even accounted for. We are just focusing on the mortalities now. So even though childbearing is joyful, it's also a very risky business. <laughs> so there should be a, a fine balance between the numbers and the quality so that you, are, you have a quality life and then the children also have quality life. What, what, what we say, look, are, are we overwhelmed? Because, you know, as we speak, there are so many little girls who are in areas where, you know, you and I don't even venture to go in there. They're not going to tune to PM Express. And so how, how then do you, and they're also going to grow up and then start, yeah. and there's lots of them. Lots of them. Last year, I think in Central Region alone, there were 14,000 teenage pregnancies. I mean, is a huge number. That's yeah. not nationwide in no. the central region. Yeah. So are, are we overwhelmed? You know, even in the western region, the, the, the fathers are bringing their girls out from school to be mates, to be trotter mates, because they are more trustworthy, they keep the money better. You know, but I think that if you have a child or two, there's no way you are going to let that girl be a mate. Mm -hmm. But then if you have six, seven of them, then you can afford to, to, to devalue some of them. Mm -hmm. You know? So I think we should be putting quality on, 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 on the children that we bring up. Because the quality that we, we, can't, we, cannot, we cannot sow rice and reap corn. Mm. What we sow is definitely what we are going to be reaping. And as you said, we are all supposed to be part of the solution. The religious authorities, the traditional authorities, 
We don't want galamse, zero tolerance for galamse. Why can't we have zero tolerance for teenage pregnancy in our uh, localities? I think it is important. Or uh, why can't we have uh, zero tolerance for irresponsible uh, parenting? Because some of the parents are really irresponsible. Is it because maybe they, they don't know of anything? That, that's, yes. That's, you know, that's the best they are. That is true. That is why, as a country, for me, I think the foundation of any country is a family. Mm -hmm. The family, we should put some value on the family. You know, some other countries have a, a training for parenting, which we can adapt. After all, from now to September, our schools are empty. So why can't we have three months program for parents, you know, on parenting, sponsored by the state. It's all part of development. Because the human resource is the most important resource. Mm. You know, and what we, we inculcate in the children, that is what will surely reap. And now there are no values. So. Do, do, how, uh, how big is the role of making sure that the girl child is you know, properly uh, endowed with knowledge and experience? How, how important is the population control? You know, what role does the girl child play? Well, the girl child, you know, when we talk about fer total fertility rate, you know, we said the children, it's the girls, mm -hmm. because it's the girls who give birth. And research has shown that when girls are educated, they have better nourished children, their children are more educated, their children are healthier, and society develops better, you know. So the girl child, yes, we need to put some premium on. But believe you me, parenting is a difficult task. Mm -hmm. It takes time, it takes money, it takes effort. So it's, for me, I don't see how you can, well, in those days you can have 10 children because it was a communal uh, upbringing. Mm -hmm. But in this day where it's just you and your children, 10 of them, I don't see how it would be possible to do that. So I think the focus should be on quality. The focus should be on quality. If you have one child and it is, I mean, you can beat your chest out that this is my child and it's gone this far. I think it's better than having 10, 6 of them and none of them is, is, you know, producing much. Doc, I'm going to take a quick break, and then when I come back, I want to find out if uh, the National Population Council, you know, takes into account, you know, the education that we had before formal education, you know, before depot and all those things. I mean, should we bring them back in terms of checking what the growth of the population is? No more. Well, we are looking at the hidden menace, the ticking time bomb, and that's the speed with which the population is growing 2.5% a year, which means in 28 years, we will double, double. And if you're looking at our space, our little e-blocks and our little uh, chips compound, are we going to be able to double them in, in the same amount of time? That would be the question. But before the break, Doc, I wanted to find out. You know, uh, you know, when, when there was this depot and everything, I mean, did it slow down or regularize growth? Or we, the elite schooling, look, forget about that. Just pop a pill and don't give birth. <laughs> well, it did help. But, you know, for the population issue, the migration, especially the internal migration, mm -hmm also broke down the, the, the family system, mm. you know, because if you are in an area, in the rural areas, for instance, it will be very, very difficult to, to engage in sexual activity because, I mean, you are in the community and everybody will see you, but then when they see you off to the urban areas to go and look for money, greener pastures, and just like when you go abroad, because you are in the urban area, they think you are making it, so then there's pressure on you, bring money, this is sick, this is... You know, this relative is sick, we need money for that. So if you're not getting money, you're not getting the meaningful employment, then probably you'll be tempted to. Then after all, nobody's seeing me here because, I mean, I'm out of my There's zone. No shame. There's no shame on the family. There's no shame on the family. And they, they, they're asking me for money anyway. And I have to send them money because they won't understand why I'm in Accra, Kumasi, or Takradi, and I'm not making any money. Then with time, you realize that, or oh, probably it's even easier to... Uh, trade sex for money, you know, instead of going through the hassle, the sun and all that, you know. So, but if then we had uh, had good structures, 
we have developed evenly and people have stayed in the rural areas, then you will not even be tempted to, to come to the urban areas and engage in this. Because if we continue to do the depot which kept our girls from having sexual intercourse before marriage and they have to come to Accra and work, how would the depot work? Mm. Because in Accra nobody knows you. Exactly. Doc, the other thing which maybe uh, viewers will understand is the, the size with which the population, if you say 2.7 percent, percent, you know, percentages don't make, but numbers wise, what are we growing per day? We're growing about 1,800 per day. That's a net increase. That is, we deliver about 2,000 something, and then the death, when you take it out, is about 1,800 net increase every day. Death as in those living and dying or those who were born and died? Those who were living and dying. So, so two, two check, uh, 200 checkouts yes. and 1,008 coming? Yes. No, 2,000 two, 2, check in. Oh, okay. And then about 600 checkouts. So then the net increase is about 800. So oh. every day we increase by about 1,800 people in Ghana. So annually we increase by 800,000. So then if we have to catch up with job creation, then the job creation should not be less than 800,000 annually. No, no, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> because I think, we I think we have to repeat that. Because that's the reality. Yes, that's the reality. I mean, yes, I mean, that, that, that mm, is so theoretical. Every, but means every year about 800,000 people. We'll get, to, we'll get 18 into 18, uh -huh. yes, that's what I mean. You know, maybe slightly less, but we'll get into 18, we'll get into 18. So then if you have to catch up, then that should be the rate. So in terms of classrooms and uh, school buildings, every year you need to make provision for approximately 800,000 people? Yes, you need to make provision for, I mean, those, well, but some will be coming out, mm. you understand? Some will also be can, coming out. But you see, the population is like a, the, the lily in the pond. You know, the lily in the pond, there was a, a, a pond and a lily, and the lily doubled every day. On the 30th day, the pond was full. When was the lily, when was the pond half full? I'm asking you. I don't know. The pond, <laughs> you know, we had a lily in the pond, okay? And Every the, day, it doubled. On the 30th day, so the, the 15th, pond was full. So on the 15th day. So on the 29th day, the pond was half full. Then it doubled. Oh, then it doubled. Of then course. it doubled, yes. So you see, it took 29 days to get half full and just 24 hours to double. That's what the population momentum is like. Mm. So you get one teenager giving birth to two teenagers, and then these two teenagers giving birth to, to teenagers, and then it gets out of hand, you see? Mm -hmm. So the earlier we, we see it as an issue and, and, and put measures in place to curb it, the better. Otherwise, we will be doing a lot of uh, quantity and not quality. The school sizes, I don't know, I'm sure they are increasing now. And uh, I don't know what is going to happen in September, but I heard some of the Cape Coast uh, uh, teachers or headmasters saying that this year they are not going to take more students than they can accommodate, mm -hmm. you know. So which means that production should, should, should be regulated. We should focus on quality. Quality should be our word and not quantity. 800,000 in a year. In a year, yeah. I mean, that's... A challenge for even the likes of United Kingdom, let alone, yes. you know, with the economy our size. Mm -hmm. Another issue that came up was our production level compared to Malaysia. Yes. Percentage-wise, what are they producing? What are we producing? Well, if you look at the the, the slide mm -hmm. in the 1960s, mm -hmm. if you look at the slide in 1960, the production level in Ghana was even uh, slightly higher than Malaysia. Mm -hmm. But then, in about 2009, production from, I mean, from uh, the GDP from production was about 20, no, go, go on. I'll pop up on the screen, Schoon. Let's go to the next slide, if you can get it for us. No, the last, keep going. Let's slide up. No, keep going, keep going. Okay. Keep going. Very keep important going. statistics. Keep There's going. an important statistic Keep that going. if you can bring up on the screen Keep for going. us, please. And just showing you how much. Okay, I think we are struggling to get it, but 
1950. Yeah, this one. Okay. You see, in 1960, percentage of manufacturing to economy was 8%. Mm -hmm. In 1965, Ghana was 9.8. But then in the year 2009, percentage manufacturing to economy was 26.5, and Ghana was going down. Okay. You know, and then if you look at the GDP in billions, in 1960, we were 1.2 compared to Malaysia, 1.9. But then in 2009, Ghana was 37 billion, in Malaysia 296 billion. Of oh. course, I know probably the others, uh, the Japan and the Chinese helped them. But then it shows the correlation between the total fertility rate and GDP and the dependency ratio. Dependency so you ratio. see the dependency ratio, 96, 90, and then 48 for Malaysia in 2010, and 76 for Ghana in 2014. I mean, this is something that policymakers should really take into account. Yes, I, I, I think so. I think we should really con consider this. Because, you see, as the total fertility rate decreases, dependency ratio also decreases. You see? So when the dependency ratio is decreasing, it gives you more room for development. Mm. And then it also gives you quality human resource. You know, the Galamse issue, one story I read, uh, they had the, the, the trucks, but then they needed expertise. So they brought the Chinese to manage the trucks. So then there's even a gap of skill. Otherwise, you could just get the trucks, and the Ghanaians would have uh, worked on the trucks. But then, because of the skill set that we didn't have, we needed to bring even the Chinese to Man so the if, tracks if, in even, even to destroy our own waters, we, we were not qualified enough to, we were not to even destroy. <laughs> they are even competent to destroy our own waters. It doesn't get sad. <laughs> it does not we get not competent sad to do that. that. We need that help. <laughs> but what, what, what I would say is, I mean, are these reports, you know, available to, to the big players who make policies for the nation? Yes, we've made, we've made some available. But then we are also talking about it. I know we are talking about it. You see, the reason why I say that is because, you know, we hear all the time, well, I will create jobs, I will bring jobs, we are creating jobs, we are creating jobs. But if you look at the numbers, then we really need to, you know, rethink because the jobs that we are creating is just a, a, a drop in the ocean. Yes, it, it's really not a drop in the ocean. It's important. But then, you see... I, I, I love uh, imagery. You see, when you go to the village, if you have this tripod, you can't cook on one, you can't cook on two, but you can cook on the three, yeah. which means that you need other interventions to make it work, mm -hmm. just like the tripod. Mm -hmm. You need the, the legs to make sure that you can cook the soup and the food on, you know. So yes, the job creation is good, but then family planning is an, is an economic imperative because we can do the LIP programs we can give them money to take them out of poverty, but if they keep producing the rate at which they are, they will never be out of poverty. And you will never have enough money to keep giving. And they will never have enough money to keep giving. So the focus should be on quality. But now, I'm, I'm sure you, if I say, well, we have to go and secretly jab them to make them infertile, you're going to say, oh, no. So, oh, no. So, so then how is the way forward? The way forward is... is glamorizing small family size. Mm -hmm. it, that, that is the way forward. Why is it that uh, now we are paying the embassies to go abroad? Why are we paying? Formerly it was slave trade. They came to just uh, mm -hmm. carry us against our will. Mm -hmm. But now we are actually paying the, 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 the visas and they are refusing and we keep paying, we keep paying, we keep paying. So which means that we want the conditions out there. Mm. And for the conditions out there, this is what they did to get to where they, they are. So I think we have to be focusing on the advantages of small family size. You should have the number of children you can comfortably take care of. And, and then the delivery will be safer. Doc, but I mean, there are some people who may not be able to take off half a child, let alone a full child. So is that person then going to say, look, looking at my state, I live in a shack you know, covered with uh, plastic sheets, therefore I'm never going to have children? No, that is not the issue. That is why we have the population, that is why we have the, uh, the free maternal policy. So at least it makes you a mother, but then we can't be paying for 10 children when you are living in a, a, a place where, I mean, you are squatting somewhere, you have 10 children. You see, if we don't do that as a nation, 
these children will definitely grow up. They're not going to remain children for 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. They're going to grow up and they're going to survive. And how are they going to survive? You know? So yes, everybody, motherhood is, is good. Everybody wants to be a mother. But then the state is there to support you to be a mother at least to a level. Then support you also to take care of the children. So, uh, another thing you raised was uh, migration as a population control. Yes. How, you know, the West, how does it work? You see, the determinants of population are just three. Mm -hmm. Fertility, mortality, and migration. Okay. These are just the determinants of, 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 uh, of population, mm -hmm. you know. The West have managed to reduce mortality, and they have reduced fertility. Some of them have aging populations now. So the third option they have now is migration. So the migration will be made family friendly. They'll make it easier for our elite to migrate, our elite who are young, you know, and migrants are the healthiest people because if you are sick, you never leave your country. So migrants are the healthiest people. The respective countries invest in them, in their education, in their immunization and everything for free. Then when they have their tertiary education and their marketable, and because the conditions are here are not so good, so much unemployment, graduate unemployment, then they float to the lotteries. And then we, uh, I've never seen any uh, taxi driver win the lottery. I don't know, maybe you have, but no I haven't way. seen any, yes. So it's always the teachers and, and the nurses. It's always the teachers, the nurses, and the graduates, you see. So that is why we don't have any choice but to make sure that the economy, it's okay and conducive for us to stay and develop our country. Because nobody would do it for us if we don't. Is, is it possible, though? Yes, it is possible. It is possible if we stay committed to it. Because that's the only choice. You see, if we don't, what is going to happen is that nature will confront us with it. Because mortalities are going to go up. Every weekend, there's a funeral. I haven't gone abroad and seen any funeral every weekend before. But every weekend, there's a funeral. So there's so much stress. People are probably just dying prematurely. You know, so those are all signs of, of for me, a stressful uh, existence. Mm. Every weekend, you have about two or three or four. You don't know which one to attend. You know. I know. Uh, tell, tell me about. It. Yes. <laughs> uh, tell me my story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and you see the ages 40, 50. You know, before anybody dies outside, about I mean, old age, ripe old age, and the person passes on. The numbers of children and people we are seeing on the road, you know, peddling PK, chewing gum, and all that, is there a direct correlation to what is happening? Yes. I think I, I totally agree with the president when he said we should be citizens. So who, we, sh we have to now start defining who a Ghanaian is. Mm. We have to have the qualities of a Ghanaian and say that a Ghanaian should be this and this and this and that. And as a community, insist that everybody who brings anybody into this world make sure that the person, of course, with communal support, develops to that level. Is a Ghanaian child, 10 year old, selling PK at 10 p.m. on the street? Is that our definition of a Ghanaian child? Then, if that is our definition, then we live by it. But if that is not our definition, you know, in South Korea, one of their policies was that your your a success depended on the outcome of your children. That's one of their values. So then, for you to be respected in the community, it's not what you have become, but what your child has become. So I think we really have to start thinking of the values that we have and define who a Ghanaian child is, who a Ghanaian adolescent is, who a Ghanaian parent is. Is a Ghanaian uh, parent an irresponsible uh, uh, father or mother? You know, we, we were once in the Ashanti region, a 12-year-old in school comes and sees that my mommy is asking me to trade sex for money so that I can complete my school. 12. 12, yes. Is that a good parenting? So what about this girl? She goes, she becomes a mother. What is she going to teach, teach her child? You know? So we really need to, to, especially the traditional authorities, we need to have some hard talk. I talk to traditional <laughs> authorities. You, you, you're talking about linking the leap to the fact that well, if you have a small family, you, you, how does it? 
What, what are you proposing? You see, what I'm proposing, and what they proposed, I think, in Thailand, mm -hmm. was, yes, they had the leap. They had the leap. They had their family planning methods, the whole gamut of them, the most effect, uh, efficient ones. And then you could, you, could, you could have the leap, but then you could have free access, access to loans, interest-free loans, if you opted for any method. Okay. You know, if you have children, you want to take care of them, you don't, you're not getting a loan or something, they said, okay, the state has some money for you, interest-free loan. You can take the method today, tomorrow if you don't take it, no problem, you still have the money. But then you would have to uh, consider these options because even though it's interest-free, you still have to pay for the loan mm -hmm. and you should, you should be able to sustain your family as well. Because if the leap does not go in tandem with some of these policies, I'm afraid the numbers are just going to keep increasing. Because the lip families would develop other lip families from them, and when is this ever going to end? But I envisage that if we have this number of uh, uh, people, at least we should see, be seeing some decrease in the numbers. Then finally, there's nobody on lip, or very, very few, I mean, concentrated, very, very few people on lip. Then we can support. Because if the lip numbers keep increasing, how are we going to be supporting? I mean, there's this, uh, for, for a population to survive, how many, uh, you know, how many kids should each family have? Well, our total fertility rate per our, population, uh, our policy is three. Because two replaces you mm -hmm. and one is for growth. Okay. Okay. But the replacement level worldwide is 2.1. Okay. Okay, 2.1. Because some will have two, some will have three. Mm -hmm. So averagely 2.1 is growth. But for us, we have three. Three is the population, the total fertility rate target. So one for, that we you, have one for the wife, and then one? And then one for the state. One for the state. <laughs> sort of, <laughs> you know. Yes. But other policies have, have as many as you can, as long as you can take care of them. But then some con contract it and say, you can't build schools for your children. So mm -hmm. still, you still have to try and be within the, the, the limit. So maybe we just have to talk about it and let people know the advantages of small family size. The, 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 the areas where the issue is, I mean, what, what, me as a broadcaster, I mean, how am I able to convince them or educate them to understand that, listen, you just can't keep producing? Because they probably think, oh, are you wasting my time? I can produce any time <laughs> I want to. Yes, but what others have done, you see, you have to create the demand. You have to have the service there in an enabling environment. These three things, like I said, the tripod should go together. Mm. Most of the time, we talk about it, uh, regulate, but then it's just like telling me to go to school. If there's no school around, how mm. do I get educated? So you've, you've told me that school is good, yes. But then I can't go to school, or I have to walk two kilometers to school, and it's not interesting, so then I just quit, even though I know that school is good. You know. So I think these three should come together. And the other issue, too, is that I don't know whether when you were going to class one, you went happily. People don't want change. But then with change, afterwards, they realize that, after all, the change was not that bad. Mm -hmm. So of course, initially, you, you would get uh, some resistance. But then if people buy into it, some people could never touch a, a, a computer when it came. They still prefer the typewriter. But now we're all using computers. Mm -hmm. you know. So change is, is difficult, but if we persist and consistently let them know the advantages. The issue is, we are here, we have a total fertility rate of four, those outside have a total fertility rate of two, and they bring us money. Likewise, we in Accra have fewer children, and those up in my village have more children, and we send them money. You see the irony mm -hmm. of it? Uh -huh. so, so once you drop it, the Financial strength will grow. The financial strength will surely grow. Wow. Wow, wow. I was, you know, on radio, and that's my opinion, and I was using this, some of these SFs, and I got calls from teachers, I got calls from nurses, mm -hmm. and they were very, very concerned mm -hmm. about parenting, and one says if you go and tell someone uh, not to give birth, it's like, hey, you haven't given birth, and so why are you telling the child not to give birth. And that's a uh, you know, dangerous attitude to have. At that child, at that young age, 12 years, 
go and have sex, get yourself some school fees. Yes. You yes. have problems on your hands. We all do, actually, as a nation, <laughs> because you see, that is why you think those who come at you in your cars with their guns, you know, if you're not, because you see, when families are small and cared for, they are tamed. Mm. When they are small and cared for, they are tamed. But then when there are many and they are frustrated and the resources are not enough, they can't get employment, then they come up in arms. So it is in everybody's interest that we have small, well-managed, teamed families. I don't think that the people outside are worse than us. That is why you go out and there's no gate. Nobody has a barbed wire on their gate. I mean, you just open your door from outside and you enter because they are all fed. Because everybody has the necessities of life. At least food, clothing, shelter, health care is there. You know? So I think it's all an issue. Doc, I was saying that if the states, we have gotten to a state, well, a place where we hire police and soldiers to guard our own water so that we don't go and poison our waters, is that not rock bottom? I mean, if we have to police our own water so that we ourselves, not that foreigners, you know, invaders will come and poison our water so that we don't go poison our waters. Uh, are you sure we can turn around? We should be able to turn around. In fact, that we really have, don't have any choice. But the issue, you're talking about water body, what about the human beings? You know, the children are being sold. You know, the children are being sold. And in the Bible, the children are supposed to, or human beings are supposed to uh, subdue the earth, you know. So if the owner of the earth is being sold, then the water will have to be policed because which means that if we haven't placed value on the human being, what value can we place on the water? You know? But if we place value on the human being and we place value on ourselves, then of course we would uh, protect our water bodies to sustain us because that's what we live on. But if not too much value is placed on the human being, then it's very difficult for me in my mind to... To, to place value on the, the land. Well, Dr. Leticia Pia, Executive Director, National Population Council, uh, we're hoping to set a very, very important agenda. I hope you're concerned about it just as I am. But who knows, maybe somebody in authority will pick it up and make it a matter of concern because it's one of those things that we just cannot get away from. But Doctor, thank you so much for uh, giving us your time, the information, and this education. And who knows, maybe we'll come back and do part two of this. And yeah, we will reduce it to 2.1 if, if, if we're lucky. <laughs> thank you for watching. Tomorrow we'll be back to do this all over again. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you, thank you.